I, Reverend Dr. Charles Davis, Associate Director of St. John's Medical College and Research Institute, welcome you to the fourth Professor Prakash Shetty Public Lecture hosted online by St. John's Research Institute and our Humanities and Health Division. We look forward to a meaningful lecture on a very important topic that has moral and ethical implications. I welcome, in particular, our esteemed speaker, Dr. Lele, and the family of Professor Prakash Shetty. I now hand over to Professor Mario Suarez, our alumnus, who will share his memories of Professor Prakash Shetty and the background to this public lecture. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Charles, family members of Prakash Shetty, Dr. Sharad Lele, invited guests, colleagues and friends of St. John's. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. We are virtually gathered to honor the memory of a man who meant so much to so many people. If you have known Prakash, I'm sure you have your own unique story to tell. So it's a privilege to be asked to say a few words on a day that marks the fourth annual public lecture in his name. At the outset, I thank Mario and Manjali Kavaz for bringing this idea to fruition, and then Tony Raj, Anura Kurpad, and other members of the organizing committee for their efforts over the years to keep this flame alight. Prakash Shetty was a man deeply embedded in the mission of St. John's Medical College. As some of you know, he was actually a graduate and a postgraduate of Christian Medical College Valor, and we at St. John's were fortunate to attract him over. Prakash joined St. John's as a faculty member and rose to become the professor and head of the Department of Physiology. His research interests in nutrition was cemented at the Dunn Nutrition Labs in Cambridge, UK. On his return from his PhD, he started the Nutrition Research Center, and that was the forerunner to the present division of nutrition. Over his career, Prakash held many high positions in prestigious institutes all over the world. And these included the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the FAO Rome, Southampton University, UK, editor-in-chief of the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and the challenging role of CEO of Lanza. My first interactions with Prakash were way back in 76, when I was a first-year medical student in his physiology class. I promise you I do not recall any of the physiology he taught me those days, because as a backbencher, my mind was elsewhere. However, he did get through to me because when I was wondering what next to do in my career, I reached out to him. And the rest, as they say, is history. I left a clinical position in Mumbai and joined him as a tutor in physiology with the understanding I would give him two or three years of my life. Prakash was quite happy with that arrangement. When I finally left 10 years later, I had a few additional degrees and a lifelong commitment to nutrition and its role in human disease. As it turned out, and not surprisingly so, Prakash had made equally great impressions on a couple of other young medicos as well. So within a short few years, Sunil Piers, Mario Vaz, Rohit Kulkarni had joined Anur Kurpayar and myself as part of his team. We had a great time because Prakash let us be ourselves. We worked hard, collaboratively wrote many papers, and had plenty of fun, and met many interesting students and researchers from all over the world. Nandini and Prakash were such great hosts and always invited us boys over so we could interact 
with all these influential scientists in a very casual setting. Such meetings also allowed us to appreciate Prakash for the wonderful family man he was, and we got to know his children, Dushant and Meghna. I owe much to Prakash for shaping my career, but mostly for showing me that there is potential in everyone, and the, given the opportunity, each one can grow into whatever they want to be and be happy. Most of us will remember Prakash for his sustained research in nutritional physiology, metabolism, and public health. But there was a scholarly side to Prakash that very few knew about. He was a naturally curious man, and his writings range from the sexual dimorphic behavior of campus dogs at St. John's to the revelation of medicine in sculptures of Hoysla temples. I may add, he had visited over 130 of these temples. He had a strong interest in the history of medicine, a department he had also headed while at St. John's. This latter passion he shared with my colleague Mario Vaz. Those interactions continued over many years, even after Prakash had left St. John's and led to the idea of communicating science to a wider audience. This view of science was not meant to be restricted to the experimental sciences or to biology per se, but was more in keeping with the original Latin, Latin roots of the word scientia, meaning knowledge. So strong was this desire that he continued his communications with Mario, even when he was unwell, with his wife Nandini writing his email messages for him. As a measure of the man, he also set aside a generous endowment for this purpose to be administered through the Division of Health and Humanities at the Institute at St. John's. We thank Nandini, Dushyant, and Meghna for making sure his wishes were realized. And so today, we celebrate the fourth annual public lecture in Prakash's name. The topic is very pertinent to the world today, and flags Prakash's wide interests. I now call upon Dr. Manjali Kavaz from the Division of Health and Humanities to introduce a truly outstanding person, Dr. Lele, who is our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Mario, for those thoughts and memories. I'm happy to introduce our speaker for today, I have known Dr. Lele for many years now and in many capacities. We share a keen interest in environmental and ethical issues, and we have been in touch on climate change questions in particular for a long time. Now, Sharad is a B.Tech in electrical engineering from IIT Mumbai. He then studied the environmental impacts of large dams while at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and did his PhD in energy and resources from the University of California, Berkeley on sustainable forest use in the Western Ghats. He is really an interdisciplinary environmental researcher, bridging the natural sciences, economics, and political science to understand the concepts of and pathways to environmentally sustainable and socially just development. He has spearheaded interdisciplinary studies in environment and development for years now, and presently heads the Environment Policy and Governance Unit at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, apart from other posts that he holds across the country. His recent publications include From Wildlife-ism to Ecosystem Service-ism to a broader environmentalism, and also the environment and well-being, a perspective from the global south. Several of his books, uh, of several of his books, some include Democratizing Forest Governance and Rethinking Environmentalism, Linking Justice, Sustainability and Diversity. He is also the lead author of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, their Values Assessment Report, 
for the United Nations Environment Program released in July this year. Dr. Lele was chosen from scientists from around the world to co-chair the International Expert Writing Group convened by the International Science Council, Future Earth, and the Stockholm Environment Institute to write the Letter from Science to Humanity that was released on the occasion of Stockholm Plus 50. Sharad, you truly embody Professor Shetty's perspective on science, and I'm most excited about your talk today. The Earth is Ill, Science, Ethics, and the Way Forward. Over to you. Thank you, Manjulika. I hope you can hear me. And uh, I'd like to begin by thanking St. John's Research Institute and the university for inviting me for this really uh, uh, privileged uh, opportunity to give the fourth Prakash Shetty public lecture. From the introduction that Professor Mario Suarez uh, gave of Prakash Shetty's wonderful life, uh, it's clear that it's very difficult to match the diversity of his accomplishments or the depth of his knowledge. But I can hope to see an overlap in a couple of areas, as Manjulika mentioned, an interdisciplinary perspective and a passion to communicate whatever we know to a wider audience. And I hope I can do a little bit of justice to that uh, through this lecture also. So uh, let me begin right away with this, uh, uh, with my presentation. I hope everybody can see my uh, screen. I'm just going to adjust my uh, screen at my end a little bit so that I can see the, yeah. So the title for today's uh, uh, lecture is The Earth is Ill, uh, The Science, Ethics, and the Way Forward you know, around this issue. And uh, I'd like to begin uh, by drawing some analogs or some connections between the COVID-19 pandemic, which we sort of hope has just now ended after two really harrowing years. Uh, I'm sorry, are you still not able to see my screen? Um, hold on a second. Yes, we can't see your screen, Sharad. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Are you able to see it now? Yes, we can see it. Just one second. Let me just... Sorry, sorry about that. I'll just go back to the title. Uh, yes, so for this for this uh, lecture, I'm going to make some connections between the COVID-19 pandemic and the environmental crisis. Uh, I know that I'm speaking to an audience which has a number of public health experts, and other kind, other medical experts. So uh, you will excuse some faux pas if I make them around the epidemiology or otherwise of COVID-19. The idea is not really to draw tight links between saying, for example, that uh, 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 human health and planetary health are one and the same, or they are so tightly coupled that we can deal with one and deal with the other at the same time, but rather to draw some analogies in terms of how we dealt with COVID-19 and what can that tell us about uh, uh, our dealings with the environmental crisis. Uh, I was really fortunate that in the middle of this pandemic, uh, that is March of 2021, just before the second wave hit us, uh, I was standing at the edge of one of the most beautiful waterfalls uh, in the country, which is deep in Bastar, the Chitrakoot waterfall. And I noticed next to the waterfall, this tree, which was, you know, a, a typical bat, fruit bat uh, harboring uh, uh, tree that occurs around many water sources, in fact, and rivers uh, across the country. Uh, and of course, because this was in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, it was natural for me to think of bats as carriers of, of viruses and disease and so on, and notice the fact that this was right next to a tourist spot. And in fact, we see bat covered uh, trees, uh, you know, deep inside urban settlements across the country. So this is not really new. And of course, they are very much uh, present inside the forest. What I noticed was right next to the uh, 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 tree that, uh, that held the bats uh, was of course new construction happening as some new rest house or hotel or something was being constructed. Uh, so it struck me really, what is the connection between the environment in particular, for example, uh, wildlife and uh, the pandemic? So some of us would have liked to conclude that those of us who love biodiversity would have liked to jump onto the COVID-19 bandwagon and said, 
well it was biodiversity loss which triggered the pandemic but uh, we know that human beings have started as forest dwellers so they have been in proximity of bats and other kinds of virus bearing uh, uh, animals for a very long time and even today millions of people especially in india and southeast asia uh, live in or around forests and therefore in cl- close proximity to different kinds of wildlife that might be bearing zoonotic diseases and the, the presence uh, of zoonotic diseases is very old to the extent that many communities have a word for it the mari that then requires a mariamma or a mariai as a devi to protect people against that disease or to ward the disease off if it hits the community so the <clears throat> the goddess mariai in marathi or mariamma in in tamil for instance it's a very old tradition uh, that clearly shows that people were facing uh, uh, epidemics of disease coming from the forest um and trying to deal with it in a variety of ways praying to this goddess was just one of them but they actually developed various uh, crude methods of vaccination and certainly isolation separation uh, uh, processes or or practices were very well known in these communities uh, the epidemic therefore might be caused by virus bearing bats but for it to become a pandemic we need something else and what we need is shown in this a uh, wonderful image of flights across the world and as you can see the flights from china to the rest of the world are so dense and so numerous that as we know the movement of this uh, virus across the globe was driven by air travel and in a sense therefore the conclusion is is the over development of this world that caused the pandemic not the destruction of forests or the exposure of more people to uh virus carrying bats because the bats have always been there and people have been in their proximity for a very long time it's the crazy amount of flying that's really responsible for this uh, epidemic becoming a pandemic and then we if we go on to look at the impacts of covid-19 of course this was a very uh, debilitating and dangerous pandemic it uh, uh killed a very large number of people it in, uh, caused morbidity on a, a humongous scale but you will also agree that the impacts of covid-19 were hugely exab- exacerbated by pre-existing problems in society one of which is of course pre-existing pollution and you will see that even during the pandemic some of these polluting activities were not shut down because we still needed our electricity and by we i mean mostly the urban elite that still needed our electricity for our fans and our air conditioners and so on um and therefore you had the pollution in all the central parts of india whether it is jharkhand whether it is chatisgarh whether it is madhya pradesh or orissa where you have coal mining going on at greater and greater levels uh, pollution the coal dust pollution associated with that and thermal power plants then burning this coal and producing mountains of fly ash which during the summer months starts flying and really destroys the health of neighboring villages in very large numbers not well documented in this country so the polluting activities which largely are industries that feed the consumption needs of the urban elite and the other thing that the pandemic showed in terms of extreme impacts was the impact on migrant labor and again we know that this migrant labor already existed it's just that the pandemic made it so blatantly obvious that for the first time we saw the scale on which migrants were coming to the city to work for their own meager wages and serve the urban elite in various ways whether it's in manufacturing or domestic service or restaurants uh, and this pre-existing exploitation of migrant labor is something that really hit us when we saw the impact of the covid-19 pandemic so now that the pandemic is receding we are confronting the bigger planetary pandemic which all of us relate very well to this uh, image of the ice uh, carving off the ice shelf from the arctic uh, or the antarctic in this case um, but we also have confronted over the last 3 months the same uh, symptoms of the same pandemic at home in bangalore due to the kind of crazy rains and therefore the kind of uh, flooding that we have experienced over the last few months so we are seeing the effects of climate change as a truly planetary pandemic in some sense but again like covid-19 we must not forget that this pandemic this global or planetary pandemic is overlaid on pre-existing crises 
number one, hunger. India ranks 103 on the World Hunger Index, regardless of what the government might say. Number two, water scarcity. And you just need to go in the summer months to any rural part of peninsular India in particular uh, to see the magnitude of this uh, water scarcity problem, not to mention water pollution and other kinds of uh, problems. Uh, air pollution. Indian cities are some, among the world's most polluted cities. And it's not only India. Across the developing world, we are seeing air pollution on the rise. And of course, biodiversity loss. The IBES uh, platform that Manjurika mentioned, its global assessment of biodiversity loss says 1 million species are facing extinction on this planet. And finally, uh, pesticide and chemical related cancer rates have been going uh, steadily upwards. Uh, it's a silent pandemic. We do not talk about it, but it is there in very large numbers. And so all of these are pre-existing environmental crises on top of which we find the climate crisis, in a sense, overlaid and causing double harm or triple harm, especially for the most vulnerable. But what has been our response? What has been our response to this planetary pandemic, whether it is the climate crisis or water scarcity, air pollution, and so on? Our response has been something as simplistic as lockdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is, for instance, the Haryana government's Pranavayu Devata pension scheme and Oxy One or oxygen forests, where they believe that forests produce oxygen and therefore planting more trees will have served humanity through their life by producing oxygen, reducing pollution, and so on and so forth. So you're again either tinkering at the edges or actually uh, perhaps even doing something which is counterproductive. Uh, or we have similar manifestations down south as uh, Jaggi Vasudev's. 11 million saplings uh, plantation claim during the lockdown and the claim that you can save the river Kaveri or rejuvenate the river Kaveri rather by planting trees on both sides or both banks of the river where planting of trees has really nothing to do with the rejuvenation of the river because the cause of the degradation of the river or the death of the river is something completely different. Um, and more generally, the, the idea that by planting trees, we can save planet Earth has caught the imagination across the globe. And you have all kinds of uh, alliances and networks and organizations saying we should plant trees, uh, say trees, 14 trees, all kinds of stuff coming out saying this will solve the problem, um, green, a green solution. And in an extreme case, just like we had an extreme lockdown with no notice whatsoever and without thinking about uh, uh, the need for calibration or the need for nuance, we find crazy solutions uh, that masquerade as a, uh, an answer to the problem of climate change. Nature needs half. So the idea is like in lockdown, lock up half of the planet for nature, that is uh, plant trees or for existing forests, and in a sense, keep people out of it or keep people away from it and only leave the rest remaining half for humanity. And of course, there are no uh, marks that I'm going to give or no prizes to give to guess which half goes under lockdown, which half goes under this greening lockdown and which half remains inhabited. I, none of us will expect either New York or London to go into the greening lockdown and to be replaced by trees and forests. It is going to be the global south. And that is very explicit if you go to this website as to which is this half that they demand be kept for nature. So this is a kind of extreme nature-based solution thinking that has manifested itself as simplistic ideas to overcome this planetary pandemic. And this has percolated even into the science that we do. So in a paper published in the journal Nature, which is otherwise very well respected, you see this map of global priority areas for ecosystem restoration. And it doesn't really require to you to be a sociologist or an anthropologist to know that this map actually coincides very well the, the high potential areas coincide very well with the presence of indigenous peoples, whether it is in the Amazon, whether it is in Central Africa, whether it is in Central India or Southeast Asia uh, and so on. So there is a very clear correlation between the areas called degraded and targeted for quote unquote restoration and the presence of marginalized communities. And so it reminds me of this pre-1992 cartoon that is before the Rio conference um, 
this cartoon had become really popular where you have a, uh, an american or a westerner driving an impala or some such gas guzzling gasoline guzzling car uh, telling this poor spanish or or rather latin american uh, woodcutter who's make a living a living by selling firewood yo amigo we need that tree to protect us from the greenhouse effect and unfortunately over the last 30 years the discourse hasn't changed uh, although we recognize and in the letter that we wrote uh, that manjulika mentioned we humans are ultimately responsible for the crisis but to varying degrees a minority are responsible for a majority of the damage while those least responsible are hit hardest by the impacts and i might add that not only are they being hit hardest by the impacts but they are again being asked to bear the cost of mitigating the problem and what more can you say in terms of a travesty of solutions so what we need to do if we are to move beyond these kinds of simplistic answers similar to the kind of often simplistic solutions that the government sought for covid-19 um not to mention plate banging and lighting of lamps uh is a deeper understanding and this deeper understanding must have at least three prongs to it one is of the natural science understanding the society nature relationship why we have the environmental crisis in its multiple forms we need an ethical uh, dimension to it as to what we mean by a good society because when we say environmental degradation it's not necessarily one thing and i will give some examples of that and finally the, uh, the third dimension is of social science because we need to understand the societal processes that come in the way of reaching that good society and it's only then that we can think in terms of the changes that we need to make uh, and the strategies that we need to adopt to move in the right direction so let me begin by talking a little bit about the society nature relationship i think for many of us especially those actually deeply into environmental conservation we think in terms of biotic systems forest gra grasslands fisheries agriculture and we see that human well being is strongly connected with uh, these biotic systems historically certainly it has been very strongly connected but what we fail to recognize that this contribution of biota whether it is in the forest whether it is in in grasslands pastoral systems fisheries or agriculture for that matter has overall a declining contribution to human well being as the abiotic natural world petroleum coal iron ore bauxite sand limestone have taken over because of the industrial revolution and the dramatic revolution in our science and technology to tap into these resources abiotic nature has really taken over uh, the role of biotic nature in many parts of human life and it is an making an increasing contribution to human well being and of course then it is in that process undermining biotic systems mining destroys forests dams destroy forests um it's uh, producing uh, uh pollution impacts both directly on in terms of public health as well as indirectly in terms of driving climate change because of the burning of fossil fuels so what we have is a dependence that has emerged from the industrial revolution which we have all in a sense latched on to because it gives temporarily at least tremendous improvements in material human well being uh, but at a huge environmental cost and a significant social cost because when we say well being we do we, we do not ask the question what is our definition of well being and whose well being we are talking about because when we open up that box we find that it is a particular notion of well being and a particular set of people whose well being has increased over this 300 year of 400 year period of industrialization and post industrialization economic growth so that's really in a nutshell the relationship between nature and society that we haven't uh, fully understood we are still focusing when we talk about nature based solutions we assume when we say we, let's plant trees to solve the problem we are forgetting that the problem originates elsewhere and therefore the solution to that problem also lies in that sphere in the sense in the abiotic sphere in coming up with ways of reducing our use of abiotic resources reducing the polluting impact of the use of those resources uh, both on the production side and the consumption side and if we open up the box on the right hand side the better distribution of the benefit the limited benefits that we should extract from the use of these resources so this immediately raises questions of what do we mean by a good outcome by a good society 
by human well-being at large or societal well-being. And certainly, we should not be making the mistake that we have been making for a very long time, that the goal is development and development can be equated to economic growth. Because here, it's not only that we have reduced development to material well-being, but we have further equated material well-being to this um, uh, uh, idea of economic growth or GDP increases without forgetting all the uh, gaps between rising uh, GDP and faltering human well-being. Uh, nor is it enough to use a simplistic idea of somehow matching environment with development and creating something called sustainable development as a concept. Because very often when we talk about the environment here, we're talking about wildlife conservation. As an urban person, uh, I see around me in the urban areas, if we, if we see, ask people, do they, uh, do they care about the environment? Their answer is usually yes, because they are drawn to wildlife through Nat Geo, through Animal Planet and so on. And they feel a certain attraction towards this so-called pristine wilderness. And that is very often the focus of their environmental consciousness. And so we equate environment to wildlife, development to economic growth, and try to figure out a way of balancing the two by having development in the cities and storing or, or restoring pristine, uh, pristineness to these ecosystems out there, forgetting that out there actually in the Indian context, for instance, are 200 million people that are forest dwelling or living next to forests and facing both the positive and the negative benefits from nature, including not just disease, but wildlife attack and death by trampling by elephants or uh, man-eating tigers, as well as uh, crop raids and so on and so forth. So it's a much more complicated story. Uh, so what we really need to come up with in terms of our definition of a good society uh, is at least five elements to it. The first, obviously, is material well-being. This is something we cannot forget, that there is still a very large section of uh, Indian society or broadly society in the global south that does not live at a standard of well-being that we would consider absolutely minimum essential uh, material well-being. Coupled with that idea of material well-being, however, we have to draw the essence from the wildlife movement or from that element of the environmental movement the non-material quality of life, which includes the presence of nature in some form or the other, whether it is trees in your backyard, whether it is, uh, you know, even pets in your house, that's where it starts. But hopefully it expands to the idea of having nature uh, uh, as much accessible as possible to the entire population so that it improves their non-material quality of life, their spiritual quality of life. And thirdly, of course, we know that we want to maintain this well-being over time. This idea of sustainability, sustainability has now actually become a buzzword. Everybody's talking about it. The, at the core of it is simply the idea that whatever we like today, we would like to see it maintained over the future, our own future, as well as the lives of future generations. And we have to figure out a way of ensuring that we do not do something today that actually makes us fall off the cliff or future generations fall off the cliff tomorrow. Uh, so this idea of sustainability is relatively simple and appealing to people in terms of what environmentalism means. But in the process, we should not forget that there's also an equity and justice dimension to environmentalism, which is absolutely central. And it's inseparable from the idea of environmentalism, as I will say in, uh, explain in just a moment. And finally, the idea of democracy, because we can never get a full agreement on what is our definition of material well-being, minimum material well-being. We cannot get a full agreement on what is the non-material quality of life. For somebody, it might just still be watching Animal Planet rather than having some animals in their backyard um, or other ideas of sustainability and justice. And therefore, in order to resolve, in order to resolve different ideas of a good society, we will need a process. And that process has to be a process that we all agree upon. Therefore, it has to be a democratic process and not something imposed from the top. Now, how does environmentalism relate to this? Because very often people say, oh, ideas of equity and justice, oh, they come from, you know, social activists. It's got, got nothing to do with the environment. Um, ideas of democracy have nothing to do with the environment. Ideas of development are actually antithetical to environment. So why are we talking about material well-being in an environmental uh, lecture? So I think it's really important for us to understand that environmentalism overlaps and in fact encompasses all of these concerns because 
we draw our material well-being from the environment. And as the Chipko movement actually pointed out, that trees are, were not just for hugging. The Chipko movement originated because there was a local level, small scale industry that wanted to have access to forests, to the timber in their forests, to make cricket bats and other kinds of uh, things to sell and make a livelihood. But they were denied that access and timber logging was done by contractors from the plains of Uttar Pradesh, rather than giving rights to the timber to the communities around the forests in Uttarakhand itself. And that was the trigger for the Chipko Andolan. The hugging of trees was not just because they loved trees in any kind of uh, spiritual way only, but that they saw trees as part of their livelihoods. Uh, and of course, non-material well-being, nature as an uplifting experience. This is something that all uh, nature conservationists or wildlife conservationists will tell you. What we need to remember that we don't have to romanticize nature in order to make this argument. Because we are constantly struggling to balance our relationship with nature. We are putting up net lawn to keep the mosquitoes out, even as I want to see outside and look at the trees perhaps outside my window. I want the trees, but not the mosquitoes and so on and so forth. So it's a balance, it's a challenge, and we should not romanticize that by saying nature is all wonderful. But there is absolutely no doubt and there is an enormous amount of evidence that nature provides a certain spiritual, a certain uplifting experience that is a critical part of the mental well-being of people. And so we need to provide for that in our idea of um, environmentalism and idea of societal well-being. And of course, sustainability, is a very obvious manifestation of environmental thinking because it started with the idea of forests and fisheries that today's harvest must not uh, eat into the productivity that we might want tomorrow. Uh, whether it is, uh, and you can extend that to agriculture, you can say that we should not do cultivation in a way that leads to the land becoming infertile a few years down the road. So sustainability, because today's actions may come back to hurt us tomorrow, is an absolutely central tenet of environmentalism. What I'd like to spend a little bit more time is on these last two elements, the idea of justice. So if you actually walk on the street and you are in an area where there is pollution from a factory, which is blowing downwind to a settlement. And if you ask people in the settlement, uh, you know, is this a problem? Obviously they will say, yes, the pollution or the smoke from the factory is a problem. And if you ask them, why is it a problem? They are not likely to say that this is unsustainable. Because in fact, the factory, if it was powerful enough to continue to flout environmental laws, physically speaking, it can go on producing smoke and can go on sending the smoke downwind to somebody else and destroying somebody else's health. And that does not really affect the well-being of the factory, unless perhaps it is drawing the labor from that settlement for its uh, workers, but it might easily replace the, that labor with some other labor. So um, by physically speaking, downwind, environmental impacts or as we say in economics environmental externalities is really a very central part of the environmental problem whether it is smoke going downstream whether it is polluted water flowing downstream from an industrial area into an area where people are drinking that water or using it for irrigation with the palar river in tamil nadu not too far away from Vellore, and so many other places in this country where polluted rivers uh, are being used by people downstream for fishing for drinking, for bathing, for agricultural uh, purposes, and facing the consequences, the health consequences in terms of the polluted water that is coming from upstream. And if you ask any of these people, the victims, why is it a problem? They will say it is unfair for somebody else to make a living at my expense. It is fine for them to have their factories. Nobody is denying them the right to make a livelihood, but their livelihood should not come at my expense. And the central tenet here is fairness and justice, not sustainability, because the impact is here and now, not in the future. And so we need to keep reminding ourselves that environmentalism centrally speaks to the idea of justice and fairness, because environmental impacts uh, go across in space from a polluter to a very different polluter, uh, near or far away. And that's really a very common thread across many environmental problems. Displacement by big dams, displacement by mines is another example of environmental injustice. You want to do mining, I'm losing my forest or I'm losing my agricultural land, I'm losing my livelihood and I'm being kicked out. That's a very clear example of environmental injustice, not of an unsustainability problem. Mining by definition is anyway unsustainable. That's not the issue here. The issue is of 
at whose cost who is benefiting um overlaid on environmental injustice of this kind often is the problem of social injustice because you will see that there is a very strong correlation not one on one but a very strong correlation uh between where these injustices happen who faces the brunt whether it is of pollution or whether it is of displacement it is marginalized communities it is indigenous people it is people of color in the us uh they are the one who face the brunt of pollution and displacement and there's a, a very good reason for that it's because it's in those areas that you can flout environmental laws or you can uh, smooth talk your way through environmental clearances and very e- quickly start environmentally destructive activities you will have a much harder time doing it in the middle of delhi or bangalore or or chennai because that's where powerful people live and they will oppose those activities uh, much more vigorously they have a stronger voice so social marginalization is often strongly correlated with environmental marginalization um that's equally true for access to resources as we know very well it's dalit dalit uh, households that are often denied access to water and in the context of already existing water scarcity being denied access to a public well you can imagine the kind of devastating consequences it has and finally the fifth element which is democracy because as i said we will never agree upon uh even if we sort of broadly agree, agree upon these five labels we will not agree on the details and we will not agree on the details in a particular context where my personal uh livelihood is attached to a particular factory and somebody else is asking that factory to reduce the pollution i will have to bear that cost of reducing that pollution so we will have to have processes through which um we arrive at these solutions and the processes cannot be technocratic because technocracy is just a facade for a so called neutral objective science which does not exist in the context of any applied problem whether it is public health or environment and therefore we need to take uh, uh, we need to upfront acknowledge the need for a democratic process as a good in itself not necessarily because it will lead us to the right answers but it will hopefully over the long run lead us to more publicly acceptable answers so the question is okay if these are our goals why are we so far away from the, these goals today if we look at the last 50 years uh, coincidentally this is not just 2 years after the covid-19 pandemic but also 50 years after the first international conference on the human environment that was held by the united nations in 1972 in stockholm and this 50 years provides an interesting retrospective where we find that we have maybe taken one step forward but we have ended up two or three steps backwards in many other contexts of the environment and overall we f- we feel even more despondent than perhaps we felt in 1972 because of the magnitude of the problem so why are we so far away from these goals of a good society and i will point to five uh hidden pandemics in some sense one is of growthism or capitalism market fundamentalism the other is at the individual level consumerism or materialism the third is of course social discrimination in the form of racism and misogyny and other forms of social discrimination the fourth is this rabid belief in technology will solve everything and finally of course our refusal to adhere to a democratic process and are wanting these benevolent dictators to take charge of our lives and tell us uh, you know how to behave because we indians uh, need disciplines and we need the danda as many of us heard even in the 1975 emergency days so that's really uh the reason why we are so far away from these goals and i use this this uh, p- pictograph where i point to the political economy of resource access the social discrimination the distorted uh, markets the failures of governance and democracy the nature of our knowledge the reduction in science and the inappropriate technology that we have developed and of course the materialist values or the consumerist values that we have evolved um over time that are causing these us to move away from or not go towards these five goals and of course these are not independent processes they are all interconnected and particularly obvious is the connection between political economy the capitalist structure of our economy and uh distorted uh, values of the consumers because now the consumers are fed continuously through mass media and other means the idea that their happiness lies in buying more and consuming more and of course then throwing away more and that's 
that materialism in our lives has co-evolved with the economic structure, the political econ economy of uh, our society, uh, because it is these powerful companies that are constantly hammering that message. And by hammering that message into our brains, uh, we become consumers who again kind of feed the growth of these uh, companies or this overall capitalist structure. So if we want to co counter these hidden pandemics, and I'll just take a few minutes to talk about this, what are the vaccines that we might be able to use? So the first vaccine is that we have to recognize it's not the economy. Because we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, livelihoods being destroyed while the stock market goes up. Debts going up and company profits going up. So clearly, the economy has completely lost touch with the real idea of societal or human well-being. So the first vaccine I would offer is to stop watching the ticker tape that you will always see below all TV news channels when the news uh, anchor is saying something, there's still a ticker tape running telling you which uh, company stock went up and down by how many fractions of a rupee or whatever. Um, because mutual funds sahi nahi hai. All of you who follow cricket or otherwise will have seen this ad, but mutual funds is really a problem, not at all a solution because it only exacerbates the idea that we must demand and we are legitimately uh, uh, required to get a return on our capital. You know, what we really need to be focusing is a demand for a wealth tax, a demand for an inheritance tax, and question our notions that if I have saved money, I must get a return on my capital. I'm not talking about preventing my uh, savings from eroding because of inflation. But I demand an, a return of 15% and 20% on my capital, and that is legitimate. This is what we really need to question. And we therefore also need to question all advertising and advertising-based free services, which means perhaps willing to pay for Gmail, Facebook, or Twitter. Uh, this is the first vaccine that we have to swallow. The second, of course, is at the personal level. We have to start monitoring our footprints because prices are not going to reflect environmental costs of production anytime soon. So we cannot hope for the economic system to fix itself and then we will get the right prices that the environmental economists kind of sort of try to tell us this is the way forward. Because this is not happening anytime soon and we have to constantly remind ourselves, and I'm talking to this particular audience, and I, I dare say that all of us in this audience are in the top 20%. This is a graph produced by my uh, past PhD stu student, Somijit Bhar, uh, where he's plotted income deciles on the x-axis and the CO2 footprint on the y-axis. And this is only for India, mind you. So we always point to the West saying they are the highest emitters of CO2. And this is absolutely true, especially when you when you measure it on a per capita basis. But within India itself, you can see the enormous variation from below one ton, per, or ton of CO2 per capita per year to six and above. So there is a six times or seven times difference in the emissions per capita within our own country itself. And we, all of us in this audience, are definitely in that top decile, the, gra the bar to the rightmost. And you can see here that the uh, luxury goods, the, the, the piece of the graph that is in yellow, is what is contributing the most in terms of the jump from the ninth to the tenth decile in terms of our CO2 footprint. So this is something for us to really remember and watch and actually act upon. But we cannot act upon only by, for example, trying to go by bus instead of by car. That is a solution, but we know how difficult it often is to go by bus to many places. Therefore, we have to not just change individual behavior, but actually demand publicly investment in transport, public transport, and a tax on cars and bans on SUVs. We have to shift out of rice consumption individually, but also demand state procurement of millets to support the production of millets, thereby reducing our water footprint. We have to demand environmentally meaningful and, of course, income-sensitive pricing of electricity and water rather than demanding that they be free or they be cheap for all of us. Those of us who are in the higher income brackets must pay uh, more, many times more, for the electricity and water that we are consuming. The third vaccine is, of course, democratizing this whole process of decision making. And that begins at the production end by recognizing the rights of those who are supporting this economy, the migrant labor, as well as those who are facing the brunt of the pollution, which is the inhabitants of uh, mostly forested areas of central India, where the coal mining, the bauxite mining, the iron, iron, iron ore mining is happening. And that's something really we need to think about and act upon through the Forest Rights Act, through setting up water rights and regulatory systems, by strengthening the Environmental uh, Pollution Act and the 
EIA, the Environmental Clearance Processes, and reforming the mining sector in a very big way, which is associated with the idea of trying to change the capitalist uh, nature of our economy and trying to push towards perhaps, for example, cooperative mining, as uh, my mentor, Professor Madhav Gadgil, has mentioned. Um, and need to expand the idea of justice to include not just social justice and to take it out of our heads that, oh, social justice is some, some Zholawalas who keep demanding, talking about Dalit rights and women's rights and so on and so forth, and see the link between social justice and environmental justice and procedural justice, not only in terms of outcomes. We need to think of upstream communities who produce our goods and services. Uh, we need to think of downstream communities who receive and process our pollution. And the downstream includes both the uh, Dalits who are actually still stuck with handling human waste in cities, and of course, those who are drinking polluted waters downstream of these cities. Um, and we need to think of ways in which we can make uh, their experience, their knowledge, their concerns, and their rights uh, visible and foregrounded in decision making. And finally, we need to create a public science. And I, I know I'm talking here to doctors, uh, to researchers, and therefore I'd like to stress this point that we really need to create a public science, whether it is for health or whether it is for uh, the environment. Uh, we cannot remain fragmented along disciplinary lines. We cannot be measuring scientific accomplishment from citation indices and journal impact factors. We have to look at what kind of impact we have in the real world. We have to demand more government support, but not allow government micromanagement where it decides that the scientific conference will be named Pancha Mahabhutha Conference, as a recent one is about, about to be held. And we must make our science and our technology answerable to the public in terms of what it focuses on and not, not just in terms of the outputs, but also in terms of how it is done. And finally, in a country like India, where we have had this collision of uh, colonialism and traditional knowledge, we must make our science much more inclusive by combining the Shastri and the Maestri, not allowing that separation of the head and the hand, which is clearly related to the caste divides in our society. Um, and we have to therefore include the knowledge of the layperson and the craftsperson in the uh, the kind of knowledge production that we make in the future. Again, I'd like to stress that all of these changes begin with the individual, but cannot stop at the individual. Yes, we will change diets, we might change commuting habits, we might do uh, composting in our backyard, and we might hopefully change our notions of holidays from those in Thailand or, or uh, Europe and so on, perhaps to something right in our own city. But this will be insufficient because individual change must be backed by structural change and structural change will only come through collective mobilization. So to summarize, I would say that we need to build and expand on these five principles into an environmentally sound, socially just and well-being oriented democratic society or to put it in other words, to cure this planet. Technology empowers us to change the world. Science predicts its impacts and social science illuminates our motives, but only an ethical framework tells us whether and how we should change. A holistic environmental ethic encompassing concern for today, for all humans, for future generations, for non-humans or other species, and for participatory processes must be the beacon that guides whether it is research or action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharad, for that really hard hitting talk. I think you brought in something so complex, so deep, so intertwined, and yet conveyed it in a simple manner. Uh, interestingly, we've had questions coming up while you were speaking. And when you reach the end of your, of your talk, we've had responses saying the answers have come. The one set of questions really um, is about the entrenched values that we have in our, in our societies, in our, in our belief systems. And uh, we seem to be the exceptions who want to do something 
which is contrary uh what are your thoughts about you know being that exception uh how do you handle that cynicism that we have in society uh i fully appreciate this the uh, the nature of this question or where it's coming from it's a challenge or it's a dilemma that all of us face um i'd like to temper it a little bit by saying that if we actually go around talking to the lay person across the country or across many regions you will find always a sprinkling of people who have their uh, feet on the ground and their head rightly screwed whether they have done any education at all or not they will talk sense and uh, even if they are in, you know they appear to be mired in tradition but 80 or 90% of the time they are actually using common sense and they see the world in a very meaningful manner they relate to the world and to each other also in a very meaningful manner i think the hope lies in uh, looking for such commonalities because i don't see especially in the indian context i don't see a huge correlation between education level and uh, whether it is an attachment to the environment or attachment to ideas of justice and so on and so forth we are not seeing too much of a correlation it's mostly educated people who are banging plates from christmas uh, in the middle of the pandemic in the lockdown and so on and so forth so i think we have to reach out consciously crossing language barriers crossing barriers of caste and caste and class looking for compatriots and i think we'll find a lot of them out there right so that's a democratization of knowledge as well mm-hmm. and accepting knowledge systems from indigenous knowledge sources uh so there are questions here about um what uh, kanti has written we have the esg funds introduced in the market what do you think is it too little too late or are the baby steps in the right direction sorry could you repeat what kind of funds uh esg is that environment sustainability funds Uh, i assume yes so there is of course in the uh, mutual fund arena there are now both in the west and now maybe slowly in india the options of investing in what are seen as you know green businesses uh, and so on and so forth it's certainly possible to uh, see that this is you know helping the environment but we must remember that we are still subscribing to the culture or the structure of wanting a return on our investment and we have to i think fundamentally question that because it is that wanting the return on our investment which drives drives the idea of continuous non stop economic growth and if you have to question the idea of continuous economic growth you have to question the, the structure of the economy because the driver for this demand for constant growth comes from capital and therefore i think we need to uh, while this might be a temporary or short term measure we have to simultaneously look for other ways of uh questioning our own idea that i should be investing at all and demanding and we know that we we convince ourselves i do it myself so i'm not pointing fingers at anybody else that i say oh well but inflation rate is running at 10% so my you know savings which i really want my savings for my uh, you know pensioner days are getting eroded that's a fair concern but then we need to uh, in a sense question the government as to why are inflation rate so high Uh, when company growth rates are also so high and so on and so forth so we have a long way to go in terms of demanding structural changes and we should not get uh, satisfied by only talking about these marginal changes okay so there is maybe what you know the economies of scale how do we get a critical mass to feel this way before it is too late i mean you touched upon it in your first answer but really do we have that time to wait for this mass movement are we looking for you know a revolution or how do we all feel the same can we wait is the question so i think that this can be this can go both ways so if we say we cannot wait let's say we answer the question say we cannot wait what is the logical corollary of that it is that then we have to impose environmentally sound behavior top down but that's 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 not going to happen because those who impose those who are in power are themselves uh captive to anti environmental interests and so there is never going to happen that this change will come top down the change will only come when there is we don't have to go 100% but 
but even if we have a as they say in the in the uh, science of uh, elections if you have a 10 to 20% swing vote you have won the day so you're really looking for a swing in maybe 10 to 20% of the especially the opinion makers to bring about fairly significant change in policies that would enable this transition so i think we don't need to get despondent um, and we should not go down the dangerous road of saying oh this is too late and we have to impose unjust measures because uh, people have to sacrifice for the sake of the environment you know who ends up sacrificing and who ends up talking about the environment without sacrificing right so there's another set of questions really about planting of trees uh you know connected with the species of trees that we plant is there some thought that can go into that are there some uh, studies that have linked the two i mean obviously there is a lot of science about which trees to plant and what are the implications <clears throat> i think what is happening again try to your earlier question of you know we have no time so it's the uh, global north which, which sees these icebergs uh, floating down from greenland or floating up from the antarctic and seeing you know havoc in their own weather systems that they are panicking and saying we have to do something about climate change and we have no time to worry about due process and democ democracy and so on we have to just go and plant trees in the global south the whole idea of half saving half earth for nature is a such a top down such a uh, anti democratic idea such an unjust idea that the issue of which trees to plant is completely uh, you know a minor secondary or tertiary issue to the basic idea why are we planting trees at whose cost and for whose benefits and in order to uh, in a sense save face for whom or to get somebody off the hook when they have a carbon footprint of 18 or 20 or 25 tons per, per capita per year right right so isra has an uh, interesting question where she saying you know how do we demand investment in public sector services so in terms of transit and transport health care education maybe even cooperative mining how do we get back control to these areas so that there's more equity and more justice so uh, i don't mean to minimize the task ahead of us um collective action is the only way forward not individual action it has to be collective action there are openings even in the system that we have today which is rapidly kind of moving towards a very closed very top down and a very uh, anti environmental anti democratic system there are still openings and i gave the example of the forest rights act i the gave the examples of the even the environmental clearance processes where very often uh, mass movements have been able to make a difference uh informed uh, inputs to the mass movements have also been able to make a difference uh because production is happening in areas which are socially and economically so marginalized and at the same time we have certain acts that give rights to these people we just haven't implemented these acts so i think we have to look for these openings and work with those communities that are most marginalized uh in order to start put, squeezing in a sense the uh, government to the extent we can we have the pesa act that has now slowly being notified by several states for scheduled areas and i think we have to work with marginalized communities at one end of the story the other end of the story is of course our own consumerist pattern and i think their individual change can add up but we have to work again for collective change across cities um and demand certain structural changes that will enable that also okay so a lot of questions about what can we do as individuals i think you've just touched on those as well as in your talk so i'm not going to ask you those questions there's one contra contrary contrary or contradictory question that has come up which is with all the global warming are there some advantages for our planet for example we are going to use less um air conditioning uh maybe with all the extreme climates we don't travel so much no is there is there that counter from the negative situation i so i'm going to take this question in a slightly different way which is that uh it is really interesting that you point out the fact that global warming is not a uniformly global phenomenon for so it's not only warming as now climate scientists have pointed out it is much more complicated it is extreme events it is increased rainfall as we are seeing in bangalore as well as decrease rainfall in the western ghats and you know so, uh, so it's many things but more importantly it is regionally heterogeneous in inter, in its impacts coastal communities will suffer more whereas the siberian tundra will actually thaw the permafrost will go 
and you they will get access to agricultural land they will be able to access minerals that have been locked up below the uh, 60 feet of permafrost so there are uh, countries canada and russia being two very prominent examples which are going to benefit from warming because their tundras their permafrost will actually get freed up it will it will melt and it will get access to resources and that is partly why you see a lot of the fractiousness in the international community in terms of making serious com- uh, commitments to re- reducing their footprints because some countries you know in, in the back of their mind know that they don't really stand to lose they stand to gain so we, that's another example of environmental injustice right because it's not we are not in all in the same boat yes the pacific islanders are crying hoarse saying you know we are drowning while you guys are still thinking about maybe mitigating by 5% uh, so we are not all in the same boat and therefore unless we expand our concern towards all humanity we will not uh, address this problem adequately at all right so i'm i'm going to not take any more questions because i can see we're running out of time and i think what people have expressed is the great mind opening that has happened with the talk and the point of consciousness that you have evoked uh, sharad and i think what i would like to bring to the table is a set of classes that we have started for medical students called the citizen doctor program right now it is with only the first year students but i think we should continue and this interface between environment and social justice the environment and ethics is extremely important because we finally have only one home that we need to preserve and it should be a shared home um so uh, with that i'd like to say a big thank you to you and the audience and hand over to uh, our dean for the final vote of thanks thank you manjuri dr tony raj good evening all of you or good afternoon or good morning to all of you who are joined from various parts of the world uh dr sharad chandra lili our distinguished speaker for this evening reverend dr charles davis our associate director of the medical college and the research institute other executives of the academy who have joined this uh, event this evening family members of professor prakash shetty dignitaries in the audience from various institutions faculty invitees students and guests it's really my privilege and pleasure to pr- propose this word of thanks for the fourth professor prakash shetty public lecture and on behalf of st john's national academy of health sciences i would really especially like to thank dr lili for delivering such an excellent lecture on the topic the earth is ill uh the ethics and the way forward thank you uh, professor lili for enlightening us and sharing us sharing with us a deeper understanding of these environmental issues uh sharing with us the balance between society and nature environment Uh, environmentalism environmental marginalization and social marginalized marginalization and the way forward uh it was very enlightening and i'm sure there are several lessons that we can take from here thank you also for the very interactive uh you know q and a that you helped us with and i'm sure there are many unanswered questions our team will share it with you and perhaps in time you could respond to some of them uh, and we'll share it back with your audience uh as a token of our gratitude uh we would like to present you a virtual memento i know uh you really mentioned that you wouldn't prefer one but we are very happy to share this with you and a physical one would be reaching you shortly but <clears throat> on behalf of st john's national academy we really like to thank you and appreciate your time this evening to in spite of your very busy schedule for being with us and delivering this excellent lecture also take this opportunity to thank the family members of uh, professor prakash shetty dr nandini shetty who's here with us her children uh, for being here with us this evening and for facilitating this lecture i'd like to thank reverend dr charles davis our associate director for welcoming welcoming us this evening and for being there with us right through this lecture professor mario suarez who introduced professor prakash shetty and shared some personal insights with with us i'd like to thank manjulika was for introducing dr lili and dr mario was for being part of the organizing committee my gratitude goes out to also dr manjulika and her colleagues from the division of health and humanities for 
keeping this flag alive uh, and their efforts in organizing this lecture. I really like to thank all the participants who joined from all over, you know, the country and from other parts of the world, and all the other members who've been part of this lecture today. Finally, a big thank you to the team, the technical team led by Prajit, Maharaj, Anthony, and colleagues, and the informatics team led by Dr. Dina and Rajan, and the administrative teams who work behind the scenes to make this lecture a success. Once again, thank you, Dr. Lili, and thank you all for your time this evening with us. Wish you all a wonderful day, and have a good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mario. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks, Tony. Bye. 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 Thank you.